Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. This is State Senator Mallory McMorrow. Thank you for joining us for another This Week with Mallory. Uh, and this week, we're, we're very honored to have a special guest uh, who is able to join us. Uh, Dr. Karen Korematsu is the founder and executive director of the Fred T. Korematsu Institute and the daughter of late civil rights icon Fred Korematsu. Uh, I will let her tell her father's story, but as we are coming up on Fred Korematsu Day, uh, in just a couple of days here, we were really, really thrilled uh, that Dr. Korematsu is able to take some time for us. So I will go ahead and bring her on so we can get right into it. Dr. Korematsu, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, good morning. Uh, a pleasure to be with you, and, and thank you, Senator McMorrow, for uh, inviting me to uh, to be with you and uh, talk to you about my favorite subject, uh, uh, my father, uh, Fred Korematsu. So, uh, and uh, yesterday, actually, I met with uh, several of your colleagues uh, up in uh, Lansing uh, right. uh, at the uh, at the Capitol. Um, some a few uh, senators and and um, House of Representatives and talking about uh, my father and uh, the proposed uh, legislative bill. Or to establish Fred Cormont's Day of Civil Liberties in the Constitution, um, hopefully in perpetuity for the for the state of uh, Michigan. Absolutely, and, and, and I really appreciate that work. And we're really pleased that we could kind of extend uh, who you're able to speak to to everybody who can tune in to our live stream. So, uh, for those who who may not know, can you share a little bit about your father's story? Uh, yes. Well, actually, um, you know, my father is uh, considered, uh, uh, you know, a famous uh, civil rights icon for this country, um, stemming from, I mean, he didn't set out to be that way, believe you me. Um, he was uh, born in uh, California um, a long time ago in 1919. Uh, but he just, he grew up like any, you know, other American kid uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And he was a uh, uh, third son of four boys. So he was always kind of odd man out if you have a bigger family and you know the dynamics. Um, and uh, he, uh, you know, attended uh, school and, and there and and uh, hung out with his, his buddies. Um, my my grandparents came over from Japan in the late um, or early 1900s. Um, as um, we do in this country, when we want cheap labor, we go to other countries and recruit them and say, you know, come to America, land of opportunity, and uh, by the way, we'll you know pay you cheap wages and kind of treat you uh, you know as a, a marginalized person. Um, and they they were uh, basically uh, agricultural areas of Japan because they went to the West Coast and helped really cultivate a lot of agricultural there. Um, we're very successful, and it's kind of the same story of uh, with the, the the Chinese and the Chinese uh, railroad and. Even Latinx, you know, it's take you're taking away our jobs. Go back to where you came from, and but my my father learned about the Constitution in high school. Uh, so when I'm speaking to high school students, I say, well, pay attention because you never know when you're going. You may need to really call upon your rights as an American citizen. And so after the bombing of, of Pearl Harbor, of course, um, we know that. Uh, uh, President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066, and and basically that was to forcibly remove anyone of Japanese ancestry from the West Coast. 120,000 people, two thirds were American citizens, uh, and it didn't matter if you were a baby or the infirmed. You had to be, you know, stripped from your from your uh, you know warm house and and and, and wherever you lived. Um, you could only uh, carry with you what you, uh, you could you could hold in two hands, basically. Uh, Try to sell, you know, five cents on the dollar if you were lucky, because you only had a few days warning, hmm. and uh, and and you and you didn't know where you were going. Uh, you didn't know what kind of weather. So it you know could be hotter than Hades or freezing cold. You know, if you're in the desert, it's both, and there's no air conditioning and there's no central heating. Uh, so how do you, you know, what do you take? And then you'll see, I want to add though, you'll see photographs of people all dressed up in their Sunday best, 
mm. hats and, 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 you know, just uh, all their Sunday best clothes because they were too bulky to, to, uh, to pack them, but they were very proud people. And, uh, and, you know, that's uh, to go to church and dress up, you know, I mean, not so much these days, but back in those days and when I was growing up, I mean, you didn't go to church in jeans. Oh no, forget <laughs> that. Um, you know, you're a band or your mother would even let you out of the house, Yeah, you know, back in. Um, but, uh, uh, but so with, with the executive order, um, my father couldn't believe as a, as an American citizen, right? He's an American citizen yeah. and, and all due process of law was denied. So you didn't have any charges against you. Um, there was no access to an attorney. There was no day in court. You just looked like the enemy. That was it. That was the only reason. And uh, and so, um, you know, my father thought that was wrong. And so he didn't report to the detention assembly center, uh, which was really a horse stall oh. uh, or it's racetrack. Most of them uh, on the West Coast. I mean, it, it, they were all they did was whitewash them and and uh, they still smelled like manure. And and you had a, a iron cot and an army blanket and food that you could hardly eat. Uh, and you had to live that way for three or four months before you were sent off to one of the 10 permanent, you know, permanent, so to speak, uh, incarceration camps across this country, as far as even Arkansas. Mm -hmm. uh, and my my uh, father's family went up to Topaz, Utah. But all the conditions were the same out in the middle of nowhere. Um, uh, many of them were on uh, uh, indigenous tribal land. So I noticed here in Michigan, you have all these um, kind of Indian names, right? And, uh, but... It, but even back then in, in Arizona, which now um, Governor Ducey just signed the legislative bill that establishes um, Fred Cormazzo Day of Civil Liberties and Constitution in perpetuity for the state of Arizona. And two of the incarceration camps were um, built there. And I asked one of the tribal leaders, well, you know, did the government ask? And uh, he said, yes. And I said, well, but they're still, they were still built. He said, that's right. So the government ignored them. You know, that's kind of typical. So my father, after he was arrested, um, um, was sent to a federal jail and had a, a bail hearing. And um, Mr. Besick from the uh, Northern California affiliate of the ACLU uh, read about my father in the newspaper and visited him in jail and asked him if he would be willing to be a test case because he thought it was unconstitutional. And he said, if need be, we'll go all the way to the Supreme Court. Wow. Now, my father believed in the Constitution, he believed in this country, and he believed in the Supreme Court. Uh, and and that's, you know, that says a lot for, for a young, you know, young person. I mean, he was 23 years old at the time. So, you know, he'd been through school and, uh, and working. And, uh, and so he, he just, uh, he just couldn't, couldn't believe it. And, uh, and so he, after his bail hearing, he was sent to um, the Presi San Francisco Presidio. So if you've been out to San Francisco, it's a National Park Service site now, but it was home of the Fourth Army, uh, mm -hmm. where there was 100 exclusion orders uh, issued from there that incarcerated all of these Japanese Americans. And that's where my office is now, ironically. Oh, wow. My father was in prison there, you know, shortly. Yeah. Um, they, we don't still don't know which stockade we were, he was in. We're still... They're, it's some deep in army records. And of course, you know, it's like finding a needle in the haystack, isn't yeah. it? Uh, but we're still looking. And, uh, but he, even when he went to, was arrived uh, from the Presidio to this Tan Ferran racetrack, home of Seabiscuit, if you know about horse racing, yep. people that are watching, um, that uh, his own Japanese American community um, shunned him. They uh, ostracized him and vilified him for taking a stand. Uh, and so, but they didn't even want him to continue on fighting his case, but he did so very quietly. Um, his family didn't support him um, either, and, uh, and he went it alone. And so uh, by the time uh, the, the case, you know, through the appeals process reached the Supreme Court on December 18th, 1944, the decision um, was still against him, but it was a six to three decision and, uh, and not unanimous. So the three dis uh, dissenting opinions, I mean, Justice Roberts uh, referred to my father's case as this lies around like a loaded weapon ready mm -hmm. for anyone to 
pick up and use in a plausible cause. And after 9-11, my father's case was cited as a possible reason to wow. round up Arab and Muslim Americans and put them in American concentration camps. Uh, Justice Owen Roberts uh, said it was a, unconstitutional. And Justice Murphy, uh, who also has a home in Michigan, uh, called it the ugly abyss of racism. Mm. That's quite a statement. Uh, 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 talking about that time. So those those three dissenting opinions, you know, resonate today. But my father never gave up hope that someday he would be able to reopen up his case. And through evidence uh, that was found in 1982, they, they did so in 83, um, because at the time of my father's Supreme Court case, the Department of Justice had lied to the Supreme Court, withheld evidence, and altered evidence. So who knows what the what the outcome would have been if they truly had the the uh, all the all the information, not the misinformation, which we seem to be dealing a lot with these days. Right. right. Uh, and uh, um, but uh, so after his um, uh, uh, conviction was vacated, he he crisscrossed this this country and and uh, kept speaking as I do now. But the interesting thing, I have a connection to Michigan. So towards the end of the war, you know, the government knew that uh, the Japanese Americans weren't dangerous. And so yeah. they, they they said, well, what are we going to do with 120,000 people all at once if they, you know, if we end war and they can go home, whatever that was. So they had community leaders go in to, to these various camps. And my father's youngest brother was already in Detroit, Michigan. So yeah. my father thought well, he would stop and visit him. He thought he'd go on to New York. And, um, and I have to tell you that you may not know this as part of your own history, that, that Michigan and the Midwest were very welcoming to the Japanese American people. Um, that not the South, you couldn't go West, but the, but the Midwest and Michigan. And Detroit, you know, was uh, like a, a city of a, of, a, of a hundred churches or more so, and one on every single corner, not a Starbucks or a McDonald's. And right. the, the ch building is still there, and it's called Woodward Avenue Presbyterian Church. Oh, yeah. Woodward Avenue, it's still there. It was a Presbyterian church. Then it, it went on to another denomination. Now, it's, I think it's listed as a, a, a historical site. Uh, a tech company, I think, is trying to renovate it. I would love to take it. And I, I talked to the tech company to see if we can also make it a, um, a, a boys and girls center, something oh, wow, for the yeah. youth area um and uh and and to you know to help to give back to the to the community um but the church my my mother was born in south carolina she was caucasian and uh and she received a uh a scholarship to attend wayne state university to work on her master's in microbiology and she did and then also uh, worked at Ford Hospital, because I know everybody must know Ford Hospital, and, and worked on research for penicillin. I mean, obviously, this wow. is a long time ago. Yeah. And she graduated in, you know, in 46 and then taught nurses, Mount Carmel nurses, and, um, and, and they spent some time there. And so my, um, my mother attended uh, Woodward Avenue Presbyterian Church. And uh, as all the churches did at that time, they created these uh, youth groups and invited everyone in. And my mother met her first Japanese American person, like ever. And uh, yeah, and uh, Elma uh, and Takahashi, and they met one Sunday and then Elma came back the following Sunday and they became fast friends. And actually Elma is the one that introduced my father to my mother. They went on this date. They, you know, back in those days, you could drive around if you had a car and, and on a Sunday afternoon. And uh, then my parents were um, married in Woodward Avenue Presbyterian Church. I want to put up a oh plaque. Oh my gosh. I didn't know that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I have skin in the game here. I, you know, yeah. it's a, a big connection. Wow. Uh, I'm very proud of it. So because they, it was a very fun time for them, but because you know M Michigan and and the people of Detroit and and surrounding, I said to my mother, "Do you ever face any kind of discrimination and uh, remarks or anything because you were together and and uh, and you know then you got married and you had to find a place to live?" And she said, "No, 
I mean, they experienced more discrimination in California when they went back than they did here, wow. uh, which was, you know, truly amazing for for the time and, you know, says says a lot. Uh, and, uh, and now I work, um, we work in education, but I work with um, all 50 states, including your Department of Education, uh, especially in social studies, work with your supervisor uh, of, um, of social studies and, and part of that uh, National Council for the Social Studies to get curriculum available in the school. So we have curriculum on our website, koromatsuinstitute.org, K-12. through um, Even parents can have access to it because beginning of the, the pandemic, everybody's going, help, help. You know, t- right. parents were just like, we need help. Right. So I said, hey, we'll just open it up you know, and just register and that's it. And we've got a short video on our, on our website, about 24 minutes. It's a 24 minutes of a, of a 60 minute documentary of civil wrongs and rights. Uh, the Fred Cormontes story that received uh, uh, two, to- two Emmys. Uh, so it's a two time Emmy award film uh, from 2002 that we now have a grant to, to extend it, to bring in the relevancy of what's, what's been, uh, been happening today. Um, and, and so, you know, you were talking about, yes, the anti-Asian violence and hate that's been happening in this country, unfortunately, just the, uh, um, you know, it, it's the negative and the, and the hateful yeah. rhetoric and the actions, right? And I think, you know, my, my, my point that I try to emphasize, no matter who I'm speaking to, is, um, uh, you know, prejudice is ignorance, and the, the, our most powerful tool we have is education. So Fred Korematsu Day is, is, is about education. It's about uh, learning about his fight for justice. Of course, you know, history is present now. You know, history is not just in the past, it's present. And if we don't know our history, then we can't deal with these issues. And I think that's been some of the problem. Um, and it's about upholding our civil liberties and the Constitution. You know, even when you were sworn in, you had to take an oath to uphold our Constitution and defend it, as everyone does in this country, um, whether in the military or elected officials. So it's about, our, you know, our Constitution. It's not political. It's not Democrat or Republican or independent or anything like that. It's about all of us. And we need to remember that. Um, and it's about civic education because we want people to be, if, you know, to, to make a difference, to give back and to be civically participate, you know, not only, not only voting, but also community, right? Whether it's city council, school yep. boards, playgrounds, PTA, you know, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, any of the service organizations, that's civic participation. And that's what my father and my parents actually demonstrated because they were in Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. My father was in the International Alliance Club. Um, they uh, president twice of his local chapter. Uh, you know, so this is, you know, participated in our church. So it, this is, we need, we need the diversity in this country. We have MLK Junior Day. In some um, states, we have um, uh, um, uh, Cesar Chavez, Rosa mm-hmm. Parks. Actually, I've done several years ago at a dining event at Wayne State University with the Rosa Parks Institute. Oh, wow. uh, so we partnered together. So this is about showing the diversity and inclusion in our country and, and to appreciate each other and to show respect for each other's differences. And well, I, I love that you you shared your connections here because I think that is one of the most underappreciated things about Metro Detroit. You know, when I talk to people from all over the country is how diverse we are and so many different backgrounds, ethnicities, religions, great food, by the way. You know, yeah, we've got a yeah. diverse population. You've got great food pretty much on every corner. Um, but I want to ask you, you know, because I think there's there's always this perception that, things like internment camps, you know, can never happen here when they did happen here and not that long ago. And you were only one generation removed from it. So I wanted to ask you, you know, growing up, what did that feel like knowing your father's story and and how much, you know, obviously he was still going through the court cases and we didn't get kind of even a fair resolution until the 80s. But how much did he tell you about that experience and what did it feel to you knowing that, you know, 
not that long ago, we had internment camps in this country for Japanese Americans. Well, he told me zero. So actually, I was 16 years old in high school in uh, my, uh, my, my social studies and, and, and U.S. history class. Um, our teacher had assigned different paperback books for, for students to read. And my friend, uh, Maya, her book was called Concentration Camps USA. Hmm. Interesting title. Yeah. Uh, and she gets up in front of the class and tells about the Japanese American, you know, internment is the word they use. I, I say incarceration. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to elevate the euphemisms. Um, but, and she's telling us about this time in history and I'm going, oh, I've never heard about that before. Hmm. And I'm 16. And then she says, but there's this one man that um, disobeyed the military orders. And it ended up to be a landmark Supreme Court case called Korematsu versus the United States. <laughs> You're like, wait a second. Wow. That's my name. And I have 35 pairs of eyes looking at me and I'm shrugging my shoulders thinking it's some black sheep of the family. Now, mind you, the only thing I knew was Korematsu is a new, a very unusual Japanese name. Yeah. Um, and there was only six Asian Americans in my entire high school of 2,500. So we kind of stuck out like sore thumbs, right? Mm. And, uh, or, you know, we were just kind of, you know, put, put aside. Um, and, and so after class, I asked my friend Maya, what's this about? And she said, well, this is about your dad. I said, no way. Somebody would have told me. Wow. And I said, why didn't you ta tell me? Well, she, we've been friends since we were five years old. And she says, well, I thought you knew. Huh. So this is kind of like, well, no, we did not have that kind of dinner talk. You know, right. it just didn't happen. And that's what happens in families, especially now since everyone's so busy. But so I go home and confront my mother. And she says, well, yes, uh, you have to wait until um, uh, your father gets home and ask him. And not only did he have housing discrimination, he had employment discrimination and worked two jobs. So it was eight o'clock at night. Yeah. And I told him and calmed down a little bit. And, and he said, well, it happened a long time ago. And what he did, he thought was right. And the government was wrong. That clear and simple. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't. I couldn't ask him any more questions. It's like somebody gave me a, 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 a sucker punch in my stomach because um, I could see this hurt going over his face. Yeah. Except the one thing I did ask was, well, can you vote? Because voting was very important to my parents. You know, they studied the ballot. They knew the issues. We would hear all this. They might say something to us and discuss some what was going on, especially if there was a school board type of, of issue. Um, and, uh, and, and he said, yes, I mean, in, in California, if you had served your sentence, which was, his was probation, you, you could, you could vote. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, each state has their, their own policies, uh, and laws. So, uh, and then we didn't speak about it again because it was just too painful. I think oh. both for my father and myself, and, you know, this is a long time ago. This is, right. this is, not, you know, this is 1967. So there is no such thing as law and order on, on television. You know, I didn't know yeah. much about the law. And, uh, and we didn't talk about it again until my father um, said he, you know, he, want, he, would, he was willing to reopen up his case uh, in uh, 1983. And, I, and, and until that time, I didn't know he had never given up hope. Wow. Think about it. That's Almost 40 years and he never gave up hope. And he was never bitter or angry. Um, some people that when I was up at the Capitol yesterday that knew my father said he was very humble, kind, mm -hmm. He treated everyone like he wanted to be treated. Um, you know, it wasn't perfect. I got scolded too. Uh, but, uh, but he was that kind of generous person that believed in our humanity, uh, believed in sort supporting each other. And, uh, it, it, uh, is, is truly amazing that he never blamed anyone. He didn't blame the government. He didn't blame you know, the, the general. He didn't blame anybody. It was the government was wrong. Yeah. And it was right to take a stand. Sometimes we make issues so complicated. We can't see the forest. The when they're, trees. when they're very, it's straightforward. It's simple. You've got rights in this yeah. country. His were violated. So that, that brings up, you know, you, 
it's amazing to me that you learned about this from a classmate and in a book in school. And I, you know, I have to ask with the news this week, you know, we learned of a school board in Tennessee unanimously banning Mouse, a graphic novel about the author's father's own Holocaust survival story. And, you know, I, there, there is this trend happening that's very worrying of not recognizing, you know, history is violent and there are, you know, people are capable of really bad, ugly things. And I think your, your father's story and your family's story shows the importance of, of knowing and learning and acknowledging so that we don't do the same things. People like me, elected officials, all of us in communities don't do the same thing that previous governments did in our own country. So I just want to get your reaction to, to news like that and kind of this trend that we're seeing of attempts to soften what's taught in school because it might be too challenging. Uh, I, I was totally disheartened and uh, just uh, sad that I'm thinking, oh my gosh, we're taking so many steps backwards. Um, I mean, I know that, you know, it's always a, a fight, you know, where, you know, we try to make three steps forward and it's two steps back. I mean, this is kind of still the tug of war that we have in this country, especially now, unfortunately, with the, you know, with such a big divide. Right. Um, but, uh, and, and that's, you know, acknowledged, uh, but it, it truly, I, I guess I would want, I would want to speak to the school board members and say, what are you afraid of? Yeah. Why, why did you want to ban a, a book that is about history? Yes, our history, uh, the world history is not pretty sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it, there is, you know, there is uh, some positive change um, um, that comes from it. You know, so that's what that's how we should look at history. And that's the way it should be presented to students is, yes, there have been mistakes in the made in the past. Yes, there was horrific treatment um, and and uh, of people. And that was that's the the, the Holocaust is, is the it, inhumanity. In fact, you know, when I first started speaking, I when I founded the Institute in 2009 and I started, that's when I started speaking more publicly. Right. Not until that time. So that wasn't, you know, only what, 11 years ago. And uh, the, uh, you know, I would say Amer uh, Japanese American concentration camps. And I even had a childhood friend said, oh, you can't use uh, concentration camps. You can't use mm. that term. And I said, well, President Roosevelt even referred to the camps as concentration camps and one of the Supreme Court justices. I said, you need to look up the definition because mm. yes, it's associated with the Holocaust. And many of those were death camps and war camps, right. but we did have um, American concentration camps, and and that's nothing to be afraid of, and 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 we need to to um, know the history, to know the facts, yeah. not to distort the facts, uh, and uh, and I'm sad that that people feel like children aren't able to cope with um, with any type of of um, you know bad. Uh, behavior or even violent behavior. Yes, we want to protect our children, but at the same time, we want them to be realistic about life now because they see it on television anyway. Right. So what's the difference between seeing someone um, killed with a gun and all these television shows where people are killed with guns and the Holocaust? To me, it's all, that's there. there is no difference. It's violence. Uh, except except it's, it's violence is violence. You're right. And, but the thing is, is that children, you know, they're like sponges. And even someone said, when I was asked to speak, my favorite audience actually is five-year-olds and first graders. And when I was asked to speak years ago, um, at the very beginning to, to this kindergartner and first grade class, I go, I can't do that. I mean, there's, there's just no way, you know? And, um, and they, and, and so the, uh, another teacher said, well, just talk in terms of what's, fair and not fair, you know, for all those parents out there, yeah. you probably get that, right? Um, that's not fair, but, you yep. know, <laughs> I'm moving along. Um, and, uh, and and also, uh, when I spoke to them, I, I didn't try to make it, you know, just very scary. But, uh, I, but I had this five-year-old 
raise raise his hand and he said so miss um what you're saying is that if um uh, this happened today we would um have to go to a prison camp we uh don't know uh when we're camp coming back we can't take with us what we want uh and we haven't done anything wrong is that correct and i said yes i had a hundred five-year-olds and, and six-year-olds go oh. oh now you know it it and we had a discussion afterwards and i said okay I want to ask you, um, how does this make you feel? And they they said worried, but they said, but we have hope because Mr. Korematsu had hope, oh. and uh, and he kept fighting for us. So it's 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 the way that you present um, this information, right? So you have a book, but you just don't give a book to a child and say just read this. Right. You have to have you have to prep a good teacher will prep the student for what they are reading and give them background information. I work with teachers all over this country and for a school board to to ban a book um, is is clearly sending the wrong message yeah. and not helping to learn about our, our the, the diversity and inclusion of uh, an equity and also the inhuman inhumanity that right. that has been part of world history right well I, that was my question was what's going to give you hope but i think you answered it i think five and six year olds and the way that they process information um i my my daughter is turning one tomorrow so i hope that she's, <laughs> well, she's a sponge and she's, <laughs> thank you um so i just you've been so generous with your time so i just want to leave you with the last statement, anything you want to leave people with? What should they know about Fred Korematsu Day and the Institute? Um, all you. Well, thank you. Um, yes, thank you for giving me this time. Uh, you know, the, go to the to the uh, KorematsuInstitute.org, K-O-R-E-M-A-T-S-U. You just have to know how to spell institute. And we'll put the link uh, in the and, chat for everybody. So they'll have okay, a link to click and, uh, and then you can you know, see our, our educational materials we're having. Also, you can sign up and for free of charge. We're having our special virtual, uh, of course, uh, Fred Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties of the Constitution. Uh, we're talking about uh, get vaccinated. I know that's been a big issue for everyone, but believe you me, um, you know, it's, it's to get boosted, um, to get flu shots. Um, the same outrage happened when I was five years old and polio mm. and everyone was said, Oh, great. We've got a vaccination. And then we got, no, we can't, we don't, can't give it to our kids. But the little boy across the street ended up to be embraces, um, the rest of Blake braces, the rest of his life, because, oh. you know, they, they, they didn't have, they didn't have the, the vaccination in time for him. Yeah. So um, it's, it, I realize everybody's got their health issues, but if you, you know, health, health wise, it's safe for, for pe even women that are pregnant. One of my, uh, former staff members has had no problems. She got pregnant, has had a baby, uh, just this month, um, uh, very healthy boy. So it's, you know, there it's, it, it is, it, it is safe. Um, just know the facts. Don't listen yep. to the misinformation. Uh, and you know, and and I'm hoping and encouraging the state of Michigan, the way that Florida uh, established Fred Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties in the Constitution was because seventh graders wrote letters to the um, to their state senator uh, who created the bill. Remember the cartoon? Uh, oh, yeah. The bill? yeah. And then it passed and went to uh, the, uh, the the house. And that's how uh, that day was established for Florida. So I'm hoping Michigan will do the same because it's about you know education and and my you know my father um you know said uh, uh stand up for what is right uh when you see something wrong don't be afraid to speak up thank you dr karen korematsu thank you so much for joining us okay. today and for sharing your father's story and so much good insights it was really really wonderful to have you thank you thank you stay safe everyone and it comes. Oh my goodness. Well, that was just an absolutely wonderful way for us to 
start our Friday and start our uh, our This Week with Mallory this week. So we are going to pivot into uh, discussing updates from the Capitol this week. Uh, we had the annual State of the State address was this past Wednesday. It was virtual again, unfortunately, two years of a virtual State of the State uh, due to COVID-19, but want to share a lot of, frankly, the good news. You know, I know that especially when we are so divided and it feels like all of the news out there is just, I don't know about all of you, but I am just constantly sort of tired. Um, it can be hard to realize that there is a lot of good news. So there was a lot of good news to share in the state of the state. Uh, and I want to run some of that down with you uh, that, that we've accomplished over the past year. So Starting with jobs in the economy, the state has a $3.5 billion surplus, which when we started the pandemic, you know, we were looking at a huge deficit, as I think uh, everybody around the country was, with people um, staying at home, not going to work, all, all of the unknowns about the virus. So the fact that we have a $3.5 billion surplus is great news. It means people are getting back to work, people are out in their communities, supporting small businesses, supporting restaurants, and that is phenomenal. Uh, Michigan turned our projected $3 billion deficit into a $3.5 billion surplus. So we even made up that potential deficit and then some. Uh, and we have the third highest GDP in the United States. So we are doing really, really well here in Michigan. We added 145,000 jobs here in Michigan, um, including 67,000 in the last three months. And this is really important. I know, you know, right now I represent probably one of the most purple districts in the state. So, you know, we've got a lot of people who are who consider themselves kind of socially liberal, fiscally conservative. So one good thing, and I'm really, really proud of this in our state budget is we added five hundred million dollars into Michigan's rainy day fund, um, which is the right thing to do. You know, we've got a surplus. We're not blowing through everything at once. We're saving some of that money so that when there is inevitably another downturn, which we all know there will be at some point, uh, we are ready to withstand that. So that's great. Update on COVID-19. Uh, of those who are eligible to be vaccinated, those uh, 16 and up uh, adults, so we're talking adults here, 70% of Michiganders are vaccinated. When you look at overall population, we're somewhere around 56%. So we're doing good, but we can keep going, keep making progress. We are seeing really phenomenal numbers. We had Dr. Sims from Beaumont Health on with us last week um, to talk about really the effectiveness, particularly with the Omicron variant, of boosters. We are seeing that those who've been boosted are really withstanding Omicron, this latest wave of COVID, much, much better than those who aren't, which is great news. So if you haven't gotten vaccinated, get vaccinated. And if you haven't gotten your booster, and this is anybody who's eligible, go ahead and get it. Uh, the, the numbers are just really great. And I was in Beaumont this week. I was actually out of session um, this week, unfortunately, because I had surgery on Monday, um, but I'm doing well, obviously recovered enough to be doing this live stream. Um, but it was really great talking to Beaumont staff and nurses who said, yes, they're seeing a lot of numbers with Omicron, but that this does feel quite a bit different than uh, previous waves that they seen where they are seeing uh, significantly fewer people end up in dire situations. So that's good. And that's a testament to people getting vaccinated, being, being safe. Um, and hopefully, you know, Omicron is a sign of things to come where, you know, if COVID-19 ends up becoming endemic, that it is manageable for all of us, which will be great. All right, jumping to infrastructure. In three years, Michigan has invested $4.75 billion to repair, replace, and rehabilitate. This is a huge number. 13,198 lane miles of road. That's a lot of driving. Uh, there have been 903 bridges that have been fixed, uh, which is fantastic. So fix the damn roads was what the governor ran on, and we're making huge progress there. Uh, jumping into education, there was a $17 billion K-12 spending bill, which finally, for the first time in Michigan history, closed the funding gap between districts. So now it doesn't matter what zip code you're in, that baseline per pupil funding is now finally the same across the board, which is fantastic. Um, and there are 170,000 above tuition free opportunities uh, on a tuition three free path to higher education and skills training through the reconnect and futures for frontliners program. I've been talking to people a lot about this this week on how we can take these programs and what we've learned and expand them, make sure everybody, my goal, 
um, is that every child born in Michigan has a pathway to a tuition-free uh, post-secondary degree certificate, training program, higher education, uh, whatever. Uh, that is what I am working on. And I'm really, really excited to see the success of these programs. Uh, jumping into gains for families. Uh, the governor last year signed the largest investment for child care in state history, $1.4 billion in child care funding to expand access to child care. Uh, 150,000 more children are eligible for subsidized child care. Uh, and there was also additional funding for child care providers uh, and bonuses to keep more people employed in that line of work and get more people into that line of work, um, which was fantastic. Uh, from child care to, or starting the other side of the screen, child care to seniors. So for seniors, Michigan Michigan became the first age-friendly state in the Midwest to ensure Michigan prepares for dramatic and imminent demographic changes. Michigan, and you've heard me talk about this a lot, um, Michigan is one of the oldest states in the country. We have a large population of people who are heading towards retirement. And if that is you, we want to make sure that you have the resources that you need um, to have a great retirement. You've deserved it. Age in place. Uh, and the governor also proposed the elimination of the pension tax to provide an $800 tax break to over 400,000 seniors. This is something I heard from a lot of you when I was knocking doors running for office for the first time in 2018. Uh, for those who are asking, why hasn't this happened sooner? Uh, the governor has proposed this since 2019 in the budget. It hasn't moved through the legislature. I hope that we get it done this year. Um, I've heard some people ask, why just the pension tax? Why not overhaul our entire tax policy? And that's a great question. Uh, I think starting with the pension tax is an important first step because when the pension tax was created, implemented during the Snyder administration, it really hit a huge subset of the population who had planned for a certain amount of money in retirement. And then that plan was gutted. So, you know, if you're already retired and you planned for a certain amount of money in retirement and you don't have new income coming in, that's a huge hit. And that, that you know, I think that's unfair. We need to fix it. But moving forward, I would love to see uh, a more robust overhaul of our tax structure to really take the weight of the tax burden off of low and middle income families and make sure that it's more failure distributed. I have supported ideas for a graduated income tax in the past. Um, Probably not going to happen with this legislature, but future plans moving forward, I think starting with the pension tax is the right thing to do. Then we've got to really look at how do we overhaul tax policy to be fair for everybody and to ensure that we have enough revenue to invest in the things that we need to invest in in the state. Um, and then lastly, on LGBTQ plus rights, uh, the governor signed an executive directive to do something that we've been pushing since day one with legislation that I have had to prohibit conversion therapy, so-called conversion therapy, which is really not therapy. Uh, I've heard it called conversion abuse uh, by members of the LGBTQ community. And I think that is much more accurate, which is a practice of trying to forcibly change somebody who identifies as LGBTQ into somebody who is straight. Um, there is no scientific basis behind it. It's incredibly damaging. So the governor took a step to sign an executive directive that eliminates the use of any state dollars to any uh, counselor organization who uses this practice, which is a wonderful first step. Now we've got to pass our bill to get it done, sign it into law, put it into statute. Uh, and then there were five proposals in the state of the state that I want to run down. Uh, we talked about the retirement tax. That was proposal number one. Proposal number two was raising the earned income tax credit to give over 730,000 working families uh, an average combined federal and state tax refund of $3,000. I think that is a great talking about uh, tax fairness would be a great step. Uh, proposal three, mental health access. We know that this has been a huge issue, especially throughout the pandemic. Um, expanding access to mental health and behavioral health by retaining or recruiting hundreds of mental health workers. Um, and this is what we're seeing in, frankly, a lot of areas that we need people, right? Teachers, healthcare workers, mental health workers, childcare workers. It is that attraction and retention piece that is going to be critical because we need more providers to ensure that we can provide uh, the access that people need. So more to come there. 
Proposal number four, um, insulin costs. For those who rely on insulin, uh, the attorney general just announced uh, a lawsuit against Eli Lilly looking into price gouging for insulin. Uh, and the, the governor wants to ensure that we are capping insulin costs at $50 a month instead of up to $100 a month uh, to really bring those costs down for those who rely on insulin um, to exist every day. Uh, frankly, cost of prescription drugs. We know that that is always a serious issue. And then proposal five, something that I am very excited about, um, electric vehicle credits. The governor proposed a $2,000 rebate for the purchase of an EV, which would be on top of the $7,500 federal credit, <coughs> in addition to also including a $500 rebate for an at-home charger. Uh, I am somebody, I drive a Bolt myself, so getting that charger put in at home, I've talked to a lot of colleagues really trying to wrap their heads around, you know, if it takes five, 10 minutes for me to fill up my car with gas right now, um, how are we going to see people who are going to wait, you know, 20, 30, 40, a few hours at a charger? Um, but really, that's the wrong question, because I can tell you very honestly, with a charger at home, I rarely, if ever, stop anymore. It's, it's more of getting in the mindset of, the way that we treat our cell phones, where when you're not using it, you charge it. So I get home, I charge it, I leave for work in the morning, I come back. So that credit for an at-home charger with the rebate is a great plan that will get uh, a lot more EVs that are built and made right here in Michigan uh, on the road and to cut down on the carbon that we put into the environment, all good things. And it is where our industry is going. And that is great. It was a lot of me talking. All right. I am lastly going to jump into our um, good news for the week. Let me share my slideshow. There we go. Ba Bam. Technology. All right. First up in good news this week, the Royal Oak Leprechauns baseball team are hosting a winter festival. If you don't know who the Royal Oak Leprechauns are, uh, this is a MLB affiliated coll collegiate team who plays right here in Royal Oak uh, at 13 Mile right around Memorial Park. And obviously we're not playing baseball in winter, so they are hosting a winter festival. It is February 5th at 6 p.m. It's free. That's the best part about it. Something to do in the winter that is free. Um, there is going to be hot drinks, warm snacks, family fun, vendors, ticketing, merchandise. Uh, and they're also using the uh, the speed gun that they usually use to see how fast they're throwing a baseball. Um, you can see how fast you can throw a snowball. So, you know, get competitive, get out there. That'll be a lot of fun. Uh, we will share links for that. So get out there, Winterfest, February 5th, totally free, Memorial Park. All right, next thing on our good news. This is really good news, especially as we hear the sometimes really spicy hot rhetoric come out of Lansing um, about schools being open. We know that the best thing for our kids is to be in schools and in school safely, uh, especially after oh my goodness, the entire pandemic of virtual learning being back in school safely. So really, really exciting news out of our schools in Oakland County. There were zero, zero new COVID-19 school outbreaks reported in Oakland County. Um, and that was fantastic. So we know how to stay safe. This is again, a great reminder, everybody who can get vaccinated, go ahead, get vaccinated, get your booster, mask up in public spaces. We know what to do to stay safe and stay back out in our lives these days and great news from Oakland schools. Last but certainly not least on our good news this week, uh, this young student, very excited, Aditya Yogesh, who's a fifth grader from Troy's Barnard Elementary School, is the grand prize winner of the 2022 Kids Clean Water Calendar Contest, uh, which was run by the Oakland County Water Resources Commission Office. Uh, the calendar contest is open to local fourth and fifth grade students, and the calendars are available for free at various Oakland County libraries while supplies last. Uh, Yogesh's artwork, which is titled Save Today to Survive Tomorrow, is featured on the cover of the 2022 Kids Clean Water Calendar. And there were over 600 art submissions from kids, 12 finalists, 36 semifinalists, and Yogesh uh, got his artwork on the calendar. And it looks like a super cool water bottle. That's amazing. Uh, and he is the first student in the contest's history to win the calendar contest grand prize 
two years in a row. So he is a force of nature. Congratulations. Uh, and I'm going to go see if I can pick up a calendar. So with that, I am going to turn off my screen sharing. Uh, I'm going to bring on the voice of Liz this week. So we're having some technical difficulties and could not get her camera working, but we've got a beautiful <laughs> picture of her. So the voice of Liz is here to facilitate uh, any questions. So you heard a lot of talking from me and Dr. Korematsu this week. So this is time for our live Q&A. So a, how this works. We live stream this on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. This is your opportunity to ask anything you want to ask. But the only thing that we ask is that you type your name if that is not immediately obvious by your username. This is especially true for Twitter and YouTube. Um, what city you live in, we want to make sure we are prioritizing constituent questions. And then go ahead and fire away with your question. So Liz, do we have any questions this week? We do. Yeah. Sadly, I've been subject to the rudeness of technology, but technology. I took a selfie and I added myself in there. So it's like I'm there. Um, I was going to say, yeah, that's what I saw you in earlier today. So it's, that's yeah. a today picture. Yep. <laughs> it is like a 15 minutes ago picture. Um, we have one question from Kathleen who wrote in to our district inbox um, from Birmingham. Wanted to know um, about our OMA bill, the Open Meetings Act bill. Um, and wants to know more about it and um, know if it has support or movement. Fantastic. All right. So quick overview on the Open Meetings Act, OMA, is the law here in the state that requires that all boards, commissions, uh, public bodies have to meet physically in person, uh, post their meetings within a certain time window so that the public is aware, so that the public can come uh, and participate in these meetings. Now, that has been a challenge with COVID-19 and the pandemic. So uh, you may remember at the start of the pandemic, all of the local county boards, commissions, uh, city councils, city commissions were meeting virtually, uh, but those bills to allow for that expired. So I have introduced a bill that would extend the ability for local municipalities to decide for themselves whether or not they want to meet virtually through the end of 2023. Um, our understanding, uh, Kathleen, is unfortunately the Republican majority is not interested in extending that bill at this time. Um, we have heard some concerns from the majority about, you know, potentially leading to people not showing up for meetings or being out of state, um, all of which I believe and know can be solved by just setting strict guidelines for how to participate in meetings virtually. I know when I log on to um, some of the state uh, work groups that I participate in, I have to report where I'm calling in from. So, you know, I log on and I say it's Senator McMorrow, Royal Oak, Michigan. Uh, so I can't be, you know, somewhere out of the country logging in. So that bill has uh, been introduced, no movement so far. There are also a few other bills that are pending. Uh, I know Senator McCann, one of my colleagues, has a bill that would allow um, members of boards or commissions to be able to participate in meetings virtually for any medical reason. Uh, that also hasn't been taken up yet. So, so far, no movement. We have been having uh, meetings. We regularly have quarterly meetings with all of our local mayors and city managers, as well as first responders, police, fire, et cetera. Um, <coughs> we've asked all of our municipalities to send in letters of support for this legislation. Um, and frankly, if you know people in other municipalities, counties, areas of the state, because we, we know that locals want this. Um, and frankly, having virtual meetings gives a greater element of participation, frankly, for the general public, where, you know, if you're not going to go sit in a city council meeting on Monday night for three hours, you can log in, which is great if you have a job or kids or, you know, you just can't get over uh, and commit that the amount of time. So it's something that I support. Uh, if you are somebody who supports this, we would ask that you send in letters or emails to uh, committee chairs to take up the legislation. And we're happy to share that information with you if that is something that you are interested in. But that is OMA 101. All right. That's the uh, only question I see. All right. Well, thank you, Liz. I'm going to let you go, your, your selfie go. My goodbye. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. This was just a really, like I said, just an honor to have Dr. Korematsu um, to talk about a really important 
part of our history and one that really didn't happen that long ago. You know, a reminder of us that that we have to learn all of history and be honest with it. But I really loved how hopeful she was, um, and I think we can all learn something from you know, hearing that that her father didn't hold a grudge. You know, this would be something that would be easy to carry a lot of anger around with you. Um, and, and he didn't. So I think that that is something that I'm going to hopefully carry with us. Uh, we will be sharing this out for people to watch. I know we had uh, some notes from some teachers who said they wish they could log in with their students and watch this discussion with Dr. Korematsu. So we'll be sure to clip that and send it out if you're interested. Um, but thank you for joining us. We hope you have a very safe weekend and we'll see you next time.